Welcome to You, Me, Empathy, the official podcast of the Feely Human Collective. On this show, we explore the struggles, the triumphs, the brights and the darks we face as humans trying to be human on this wondrous and overwhelming pale blue dot. You, Me, Empathy was created so that we can be witness to our collective humanity through the lens of empathy, vulnerability, and emotional curiosity. We aim to destigmatize mental health, lead fiercely with our hearts, feel our feelings without shame and judgment, and share our courageous stories so that others may feel less alone and more connected as feely humans. You, Me, Empathy is a brave place designed to inspire the beauty in each of us because each of us, in all of our kaleidoscopic parts, makes up a magical whole that deserves to be seen. Today, I'm building empathy in a pandemic, indoor plants-obsessed world because I'm here with health policy writer, editor, and the author of The Future of Feeling, Building Empathy in a Tech-Obsessed World. It's Caitlin Ugalik Phillips. Hello, Caitlin. Hello. It's so nice to be here. Oh, my gosh. So happy to have you here. Um as you can see, the listeners can't see, but just so many indoor plants. Uh, the past two years, Jessica has gone off the rails with the plants. Now it's become a thing where I sometimes have dreams. Let's call them nightmares where the plants are attacking me in my sleep because there's they're literally all around us. Do you relate? <laughs> Maybe you're getting a little too much oxygen. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Maybe that's why I have the headaches. Too much oxygen. Uh, a little too much I, nature. I went in a little bit on the indoor plants. I, I also, I didn't really have any before the pandemic and I needed a little more life in the home. Um, but we still only have four and I'm very proud to be keeping just those alive. So that's great. That's great. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard work. Yeah. We've got. I think close to 60 inside on our 720 square foot home. Uh, I don't know how she does it. Keeps them all alive. Some of them look like they're thriving. Um, I feel like they're all doing fairly well. So I don't the ones know. I can see look great. We have, we also have a cat who likes to get into things though. So we have to limit ourselves to the non-toxic plants. So. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Cats, cats, curious cats, cats are curious, get into stuff. And they can climb, unlike our dogs. So, um, yeah, I understand. Well, this that. one is um, 13 years old, so she's she's a little bit lazy, which helps. <laughs> hmm. What's her name? Her name is Lily. She was mm -hmm. um, I got her when she was just a little baby, and she moved with me to New York for grad school, and mm. then to Brooklyn, and then back to North Carolina, where we live now. And she's been with me through. All my growing up years. <laughs> so that's lovely. Uh, I have a question about Lily, but um, let's first kick off with an emotional check in. How how are you feeling today? I'm thinking about what counts as an emotion. Um, if you know, if we're talking about the core emotions or the the feelings wheel, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I'm feeling stressed today. Mm. To be honest, lots of Lots of work things going on um, and I will be solo parenting for the next few days because my husband's out of town for work. So um, a little bit stressed, but sometimes a little bit of stress can be a good thing. So I'm trying to look at it that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How about yourself? Uh, uh, yeah, one pause on that. Um, solo parenting, that's hard. Uh, and you have a young one, right? Yes, she is tomorrow. Tomorrow she'll be 19 months old. Um, wow. And yeah, my husband just has to go to go away for work for a few days. And it's always an adventure. Like I always am so grateful to have a parenting partner. <laughs> mm -hmm. Comes back. <laughs> yeah. Um, have you had many moments where you've had to do the solo solo gig? A couple. Um, yeah. Not too many. And I, we have family close by. My sister usually comes over to help a little. So that's nice. So that is really nice. Yeah, we have a that good nice. village. So we don't have kids, Jessica and I, but we have two rescue doggies. And one of them is a puppy. And I do a lot of solo parenting nowadays because uh, Jessica is getting her doctorate and very, very busy. Uh, also teaching full time. And I... I think about and I wonder 
uh, from you for this. Like I think about like, what are the things that like, what are the sort of like little structures I can put in place throughout the day to help me like maintain my sanity and also give them boundaries and structures? Like, do you think about that when you're solo parenting? Um, <clears throat> I think about it on the weekend because what I have that you might not have for a puppy is I have daycare. Um, yeah. <laughs> I have child care. We have daycare and then we have, um, our parents who help watch her. So that helps. Mm. Um, but yeah, there are morning and evening structures and routines that help, but then on the weekend, it does, it gets harder because you have to keep this little tiny person engaged. And, um, when she was younger, it was keeping her safe and fed. Right. But now it's, keeping her engaged and, you know, occupied and not getting into everything, um, or only yeah. getting into the right things. So, <laughs> um, I'm still learning how to, yeah. how to do that. You know, I'm, she's only 19 months old and as a parent, I'm only 19 months old. <laughs> so I love that. That's a very, that's a self empathy moment. Yeah. I've been trying, this has parenting so far has been just a long exercise I in, self-empathy for me mm. <laughs> among other things but that has been a big part of it yeah it's your first time doing it it's your first gig yeah. right yeah it's like a it's like a balance between i have all the tools to do this i know i can do it and not being hard on myself when i kind of have moments of what what is going on <laughs> yeah good for you i mean i uh, most of our friends have kids and it, it does feel at times like, yeah, a little bit of like organized chaos. Like there is going to be chaotic elements and that's just part of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. just having more, it's having one more person's needs and wants and interests to think about and just like juggling logistics is really the hardest part of it. It's like that, that silent unseen some people call it emotional labor or invisible labor or um, yeah, that, that stuff has, is definitely the hardest to juggle. And then it makes other things. People told me that I would, that my priorities would change. Um, mm. I think that's definitely happened, but it's also that some things just like literally drop off the list just because there's not room for them or, you know, your brain works a little differently, mm. but like I said, we, I, I am very lucky to have a parenting partner. Um, and we do a pretty good job of splitting all of those things, the physical and mental tasks. Um, mm -hmm. but we're all figuring it out as we go along. Yeah. That's uh, the, it's the human, that's the human. -ing. Um, the, you mentioned like the silent or sort of invisible labor, I, I let's just make a call like let's let's sign a petition no like it's labor period like it's not invisible it's not silent hmm. because I, I i see that a lot in uh spaces like mental health right you know like there's 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 a lot of um uh just stuff that's not talked about because uh there's stigma or there's taboo or you know maybe there's misogyny as it, as it, as it pertains to, um, a woman, uh, like, you know, being a mom, right. And like the perspective culture has on like, they have to be everything all at once and never complain. Right. Like, can we just call it labor and it's yeah, hard. <laughs> it is. And I was just looking up, there's this great book that kind of lays all this out. It's called fair play. Mm. Um, by Eve Rodsky and it I mean she also provides like all these resources there's even like a card game for for making you know things the play more fair I guess in a partnership but I do think yeah we're getting to where it's it's talked about a lot more and people are naming it and realizing what it is and yeah so yeah let's just call it what it is <laughs> life what it is. life management basically home and yeah. life yeah i love that uh well you asked how i was doing um and i promised to get around to it uh i'm doing like i 
so this is not the show where I say I'm fine and we move on. So uh, I will be real and just say I've been struggling. I've been vacillating between, you know, the, some of the listeners know that I've been having chronic headache issues. And so I've been vacillating between hopelessness mm-hmm. and the feeling that I know I need to take it one moment at a time, right? Sort of like seeing that tomorrow could be different, you know, the next hour could be different, et cetera. And then also feel like, feel like I have this, and, and maybe this is ego, but I have this, and I wonder if you can relate to this as a creator, as a writer, as someone who uses your noggin um, and your heart. Uh you know, I, I, when you have headaches, you don't, you don't feel like yourself. You feel like everything's a little bit askewed and off. And it, and then it feels like, oh, then I'm not like, I'm here talking to this new person and I'm not presenting my whole self because I'm like a little bit muted because of this headache. And that like, like that makes me feel a little sad and griefy. The fact that like, like a part of me is is a little bit muted because of this stupid fucking headache and that makes me sad do you yeah. relate to that i do i think i think it's a common experience for people who have chronic pain chronic illness mm. um and then also i mean whenever i I definitely relate to that feeling of whenever I've been sick or something hurts and it just feels, you just get this feeling that it's never, this is my new normal. And Mm. am I ever going to get the whole me back? And, you know, like, yeah, am I able, not feeling able to be fully present for things because of this other thing that you just want to scream about, but you know, that it's not relevant (laughs) always to the conversation or like, it's not, yeah, I definitely can relate to that. I mean, I felt that way a lot of the time when I was pregnant. <laughs> yeah. I and bet. there, you know, in this is a different kind of pain, but like in depression, in depressive periods, mm-hmm. um, you know, there's definitely a sense of that. Um, this is also a reason why I um don't drink very much because when I was, you know, in my early 20s, I would drink and then have a hangover and the hangover would make me feel like nothing would ever be <laughs> good <Yeah>. again <laughs> yeah this is my um, life now yeah yeah I just think those are all like different little stops on that road right mm-hmm. that are all kind of related not not exactly the same but yeah I yeah. can definitely empathize with <laughs> that feeling and that frustration for sure but I but I think yeah. every like everything, sometimes it helps a little bit to know that um, probably most people can identify with that. It does help. And and thank you for that empathy. It does help. And I, I, I certainly do have the perspective of like, you know, in the grand scheme of things, right? Um, people have it worse, right? Like that's a perspective that's valid. Doesn't take away from the fact that, yeah, I'm, I'm having pain and I got to honor that pain. But I also know that like, you know, I'm fairly able-bodied and, you know, I am able-bodied and I, I'm also a white cis man. Right. And like, that's, that's a immense privilege that I'm living with and presenting myself with. And, um, it's all a tapestry and it it's a tapestry that, <laughs> yeah, we contain multitudes. Exactly. Exactly. So speaking of multitudes, I read somewhere that you had a live journal at some point. Let's talk about live journal because uh, I don't know if the listeners know about live journal, but um, I'm 41. I'm guessing you're in your 30s. 34. 34. Okay. Live journal was an online blogging platform in the early aughts. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Late 90s Probably as well? Like, 90s? I did it. I'm not sure when it started, but I used it in like the early aughts, 2002 to 2005 or six, probably. Yeah, I was, I was, I was active live journaling in there as well. Um, and I was trying to remember the name of it. Um, 
I'll, I'll like come. You named yours. What like my blog was called, and I think it was like something so pretentious. Because at oh. that time, I likened myself a you know a romantic and and a and you know I was like heavily drinking and heavily writing. Like that's all I did was like drink and write and then work. So like, it was something like jobs. Hemingway or Bukowski or something like that. <laughs> I mean, certainly uh, I aspired to be Hemingway because I you know I was like you know depression and you know all of that. Um, you know, and I was deeply alone and sad uh, as well. And writing was a thing that sort of helped. But um, yeah, tell me about your live journal experience and what like what that meant to you. Yeah, so I think I was um, I was much younger, not much younger, but I was like middle and high school when How I dare was you. when I was <laughs> you called um, me old during, during those years. I was like, I say that to say that it was more of like a confessional thing for myself and my peers because we were teenagers like in our early teens and it really was used at least by by me and my friends as like a live diary Mm -hmm. um where we wrote about things that happened but it wasn't like a blogging platform so much for us as literally just you're journaling with the knowledge that your friends are going to see it Mm -hmm. Um, and I could say so many things about that and how it's like the precursor to Instagram and so many other things, but yeah, it's so interesting to be talking about this now because I actually just last week reconnected with a friend who I was very close with at that time. Okay. Who I wrote about sometimes. And in the past I have gone back and looked at some of those old posts and just be you might be happy that you can't remember what yours was called and you can you can't go back and Oh, believe me, I am. I am. <laughs> Cuz sometimes <laughs> one thing I will never forget is um this was probably 10 12 years ago. I was in a book club and we were also all writers and we brought things to a meeting once to read and I didn't have anything recent um so I read something from live from my live journal from high school and it was right after a breakup and I <laughs> what what was truly such like a vulnerable true real expression of heartbreak and sadness at that time I was able to then read it as a comedy piece because it was so funny to me like the way that I the metaphors that I used and like the drama Mm. and I feel so much I mean speaking of empathy like because I've been going back to that place a little bit after reconnecting with this friend, I have so much empathy for the Caitlin of that time. And Mm. I, I said things that are embarrassing and I wrote things that are embarrassing, but it's like, is it, I mean, it would be embarrassing for a 34 year old me to say and do (laughs) those things, but I have so much empathy for in hindsight, you know, where I was at that time of my life, figuring out who I was, what I believed, who I cared about, like, yeah. Um, and it's just, it's very wild that I did a lot of that in public, but so did my friends and that public was much less public than what we have now with social media. So I think mm-hmm. that's the thing to remember if, if folks aren't familiar with live journal it was like yeah i'm broadcasting my feelings to the world but the world is probably still only like people who know me yeah you know? um whereas now it's literally the world <laughs> so literally the world yeah i i really love that you've had that moment where you can look back and and give your past self some empathy that's really powerful and it may yeah. like it makes me feel like I don't know. We should do a segment on this show where guests come and bring like a, a writing that they did, you know, from high school or an old journal or an old diary, and read it and then and then reflect. Yeah, there was a documentary. I can't remember if it was The Moth or something else where people mm-hmm. did that on stage, and it was just. I mean, it's heartbreaking. It's hilarious and heartbreaking, you know? Yeah. I, um, 
So when I was on Live Journal, and I guess it was the early aughts, it was prior to meeting Jessica and I met her in 2007. So, you know, it was the years leading up to that and and even th- through a little bit of that, you know, after as we met and it was a lot of really emotional stuff. And it was a lot of like me talking about struggling with my mental health. Uh, and it was like a lot of like at that time, and this is really hard to admit, but I think what is so is such a crucial part of empathy is allowing ourselves to change mm-hmm. and be changed. And so I look at that time and I'm like, there's some stuff in there like, politically like i've changed massively and it's embarrassing to to think about that and and the empathy is like i didn't know any better these are the tools i had this is my perspective you know all of that sort of uh framing is super important part of empathy so i'm curious about you know you wrote this book the future of feeling which is about empathy in you know the world of tech but like i i i always say and i i wonder from you like what your thoughts are on it on it that we really need to have empathy for ourselves before we have empathy for others like what how does that feel to you that statement like do you feel like that's true has has it been true for you well first I will say for the listener that I was nodding my head vigorously through that, everything you just said um, about, have, you know, letting yourself change and having empathy for that. Um, it's a really good question. I don't think I've thought about it in that way specifically, but it's, I could see how it's the way that people say about love, right? That you can't mm. really love another person if you don't love yourself. And it sounds like a cliche, but Um, I think I'm thinking of a couple different things. Like I'm thinking of how one reason that that would be true, that you would really need to do the exercise of empathizing with your current and past self, um, as part of, or in advance of trying to do that for other people Mm -hmm. is just like to maintain healthy boundaries <laughs> with other people. Um, <clears throat> I know that a lot of my struggles as a younger person had to do with just over empathizing and to the point of, you know, now I, I've been diagnosed with OCD and as a teenager, I was definitely compulsively worrying about people and, mm-hmm. um, you know, thinking, you know, about like what I needed to do to help them or the fact that I could do nothing and how hopeless that was. Um, And, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't help me or the other person. (laughs) Um, And I think in the context of even like a mentally healthy person, when you, and this gets to a lot of the issues with, with social media and kind of information overload, we're exposed now to a lot more stories and a lot more situations that, you know, trigger empathy in us. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to be able to know like where the line is between feeling for another person, um, putting yourself in their shoes, taking their perspective, like where the line is between that, which is what I see as empathy and, like over identifying with someone else Mm -hmm. um, or feeling responsible for someone else's feelings, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, not healthy, (laughs) but we don't know, we don't learn this really. Like at least I didn't. And like a lot of people I know didn't really learn this. You kind of learn like you're good or you're bad. You care or you don't care. Mm -hmm. Um, Binaries. Exactly. Binaries. And I think that this is really a long answer to your question of about, you know, having empathy for yourself, but that's where I think it would be most important is that like, you have to, it's important to take other people's perspectives so that you can, you know, understand how you're the same and different, but you also need to protect your, your own heart. Yeah, I would, uh, I think that's a perfect answer, long and perfect. 
Thank you. Uh, and I would only just replace the but with and. Mm. Uh, so a, a huge, like I, I, I say it all the time, empathy without boundaries is just a form of self-immolation, right? Yeah. And boundaries in and of itself are self-awareness right it's it's on because our boundaries are going to be uniquely ours like what is what is my tipping point like what can i hold what can i not hold what are my triggers you know all of that stuff is wrapped up in boundaries and and that's being cognizant of our history our our experiences our our own self right our own hearts right and that that i feel is where the self-empathy comes into play is like a big piece of it is self-awareness like how can i like truly um have empathy for myself without knowing myself right Mm -hmm. without like knowing who i am what fills me up what doesn't you know what i like what i don't like right that's all piece of it and 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 doing that work is going to help us create uh better boundaries and it's also going to help us be more useful in our empathy. I think that's right. And I think that's part of why our current technology situation, especially social technology is so concerning because in these environments of endless scrolling and the need to like always be contributing to the content and responding to the content it doesn't leave space for that Mm. and it doesn't it's it's really easy I think to get sucked in to just kind of automatic responses and automatic sharing and automatic um like I see a lot of the time when there are these like quote unquote like flame wars (laughs) or something on twitter um for example, or even on TikTok, where people are accusing each other of things and arguing about things and trying to get points across. I see so often that like, there's so much of that, that maybe should be like a diary post or something you're working on with yourself or with a therapist or something else, you know, and like, we, we, we don't, I think the culture that we currently have doesn't encourage us to like slow down enough to consider that. Like, is this something I need to type and respond? Is this really coming from my values and my um, self-confidence and Mm self-awareness or am I having a knee jerk reaction? Um, Is this a feeling or a fact, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, yeah, just like in the swirl of, everything constantly updating all the time and they're always being something new to respond to. I think you kind of lose the opportunity for some of that self-empathy, which then it just creates like a vicious cycle. Yeah. And that's really well said. Um, it's incessant. And I, I think like that's empathy right. inward or, or empathy outward, I think requires a level of stillness, softness, curiosity, taking a pause, right? Um, I think um, someone, Liz Kleinrock, Teach and Transform on Instagram, I love and and have had on the show. uh, She posted something. It's like um, connection before correction. Mm, Yes. And I was like, yes, I love that. Yeah. And I I think, yeah, there there's the the mechanism of social media uh, is is um is is vicious and it's and it it does it requires and it makes us feel like we have to like constantly being added to it because and i've like you know i've 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 been coming to this realization for years because it just like you know the algorithm like is is set up to make us do that and then we share something that is we feel like is valuable and then no one sees it because, you know, we should be paying meta money, right? The metaverse money or whatever. And 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 where I'm coming from a place where like, yeah, I've done a lot of 
fucking work on myself and in mental health. And I, I, I want to share truly, deeply, vulnerably to allow others in, to allow others to see that they're not alone, not as um, sympathy, uh, not as uh, um, a performance. And, and I see a lot of performance and um, empathy is not a performance. Empathy is, is messy and empathy is, can be uncomfortable and empathy is the slowing down and not the, the sort of vicious rat race that we see in social media. And so for me personally, I'm like, I'm slowly getting off of social media. I'm actually actively building out a membership community for Feely Human that I can own and that we can control and that we could have that softness and slowing down, you know, that we all need. Yeah, it's a lot. I love what you said that empathy is not a performance because I think that gets confused. Um, it, it is such like a squishy concept. People will sometimes, you know, yeah. think that it, that it is. Like that that. It is right? It's not like, a checkbox. Either. Right. Yeah. It's not a checkbox. It's not a performance. It's not, um, it is a connection mm -hmm. and connection, you know, can take a little bit of work. It's so interesting, like having a toddler and seeing those really mm. like initial sparks of empathy. Mm. Um, Cause in my research, I learned that, you know, from when we're babies, we kind of start with the, the neurological mechanisms of empathy, like the mirror neurons and things like that, the smiling, mm -hmm. the way babies smile so much when you smile and, um, but we were at the doctor for a checkup the other day and there was a baby in another room crying and she kind of, my daughter just kind of stopped what she was doing and looked at the door and she did the little like crying sign, like, and kind of looked sad. And that was the first time that I ever was like, she is recognizing an emotion in another wow. human. How do I bottle this natural? Wow. It's so natural. Yeah. Um, and encourage it and, you know, help it blossom. Or I guess more so prevent it from being squashed by, <laughs> you know, everything else in the world. Mm. But I think it's a good reminder that we, most of us have that ability and that innate desire to, to um, connect with other people on emotions and feelings. And um, we just need yeah. to kind of like have the infrastructure that encourages that. I, I love that. And that's really beautiful. I was getting goosebumps uh, hearing you talk about your little girl. Um, yeah, it's it's what I think is important in the infrastructure you're talking about, right? Is is safety. Mm, yeah, is exactly. like feeling safe and being seen and heard and loved and cherished and and uh, you know, it sounds like you're doing that. Well, right? yeah, well, like I'm an, like, an well, awareness I'm getting, of. No, I'm getting goosebumps. I'm like, well, oh, and and an awareness me. of that, like an awareness of you being witness to your daughter, being witness to this moment of. Oh, I've done that before. Or oh, I recognize that emotion. So powerful. Like that, that is a cascade of like wonder ahead, right? And yeah. so you being witness to that, fostering that, like you know how to do that. You know, because you've lived a life and you've done a lot of work and you know empathy. You know how to do that. Yeah, it's a cascade of wonder ahead, but it's also like a cascade of I'm seeing her and I'm like, she's recognizing an emotion. I'm recognizing that she's recognizing an emotion. <laughs> you are now recognizing that in me. And I actually think this cycle is kind of what was the promise of some of the, the internet at the beginning of things mm. like live journal and then other mm. things that eventually morphed into what we have. I think it was kind of part of the marketing. Um, I don't think it's, been the practice but I think that possibility of sort of this like domino effect of empathy and connection is still possible 
but maybe it has to happen on something like a feely human network or something else because I don't know that we can make yeah. him do that <laughs> at this yeah. meta I, I you know I agree and I I wonder from you like do you have any insights into why we are here like why are we at this point being like Mm. there was this promise and now we're at this place in social media where like it's just this incessant uh you know hellhole of vanity and performance and it's not all of that like i i don't want to you know completely uh do away with it we're not talking in binaries here but it feels like that a lot of times so do you have any opinions about like how it came to be that Sure. I have a lot of them. <laughs> I, think, I think this is like very simplified, but I think if you look at like in the nineties, the bowling alone thing, the, uh, I can't remember who the author was, but this idea that we were becoming increasingly isolated Americans, especially like didn't have as many friends, people mm. felt alone, people don't have communities anymore. There's this gap and then this shiny new thing comes and fills it, it with the promise of of actually like replacing or being another way to have those connections. And then it does achieve that to a great degree. Yeah. Um, but I think for one thing, and I write about this in the book, when most of the people who are creating a new infrastructure like that have the same come from the same background or are similar in many ways, race, sex, ideology, interests, et cetera. Mm. They're not gonna, however hard they may have tried to empathize with future users of their products. If you don't have a representative sample of people that's creating things, no one is empathetic enough to predict how everyone is going to respond to a product or an experience right? right so i think part of that part of what got us here is just kind of the the homogeneity i don't know if i pronounced that right of <laughs> the developers like the creators of these things um i think also like as someone who trained as a journalist and worked in media for a while and i was trying to go into newspapers right when that became a thing that you didn't do anymore <laughs> like the media industry just pretended that the digital revolution wasn't happening and mm. that a lot of the changes in advertising weren't happening and just ignored a lot of things I think tech has done that too like there are shiny beautiful things and there are ways we know we can make money so let's not worry about all this other stuff but then all that other stuff turned out to be like, I don't know, now it's in, impacting politics on a global scale, climate change, mm -hmm. pu public health, all these things. I just like, I don't think, I used to think that all this stuff just crept up on people like Mark Zuckerberg who could never have imagined. Um, and I do obviously still have empathy for like him and other individuals, but I don't really buy anymore that... <laughs> there was, you know, this all happened to the big tech players. Mm, there mm -hmm. were a lot of missed opportunities for empathy and diversity and inclusion and care um, throughout the process. And that was what led me to write the book. And then, which which ends on a, what I think is a relatively hopeful note of there are people, especially younger people who recognize all of this and are trying to to find a way for us to like live with technology in a more empathetic way. And mm -hmm. even like the platform that you're talking about working on is exactly the kind of thing I would have included in the book because I don't want us, like you said, I don't want to talk in binaries. I don't want us to throw it all away. And I don't think we can. Yeah. But I also think continuing to pretend that like, this is just the way we live and it's going to be that way is not sustainable. That's it. That's it. Like that is the key, right? Like what I hear in a lot of what you're saying <clears throat> is 
this very human thing we do, we get in a thing and then we say, and we were just talking about it with my headaches, right? We get in a thing. We're like, this is it now. We've always done it this way. This is what it is. And what is crucial about empathy is perspective, right? Is understanding that other people have different ideas, that you're not right. There's no righteousness in empathy, right? It's understanding that truly what I know today could be different tomorrow because yes. I could have an experience with a person or an, a, you know, a, just a general experience that could change my mind. And that to the structures that be, you know, let's just call them white men, uh, is scary and dangerous, right? The systems at play, the homogeneity, homogeneity, I can't say it. You said it very well. I can't say it. Um, that is disruptive. Mm -hmm. And empathy is disruptive. It, 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 it demands of us understanding that we have intent and impact on the world. It, under, it, it, it demands of us that we uh, dismantle, right? Because getting in our bubbles, creating Twitter, creating Instagram, and we get it and it just keeps building, we lose perspective. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. We're in our we're in our bubble. We're in our framework. We're, the walls are too high. We can't see outside. I think that's a great way to put it is that in what I do think was a well-intentioned search by many people, myself included, for more perspective by joining these platforms, we end up losing it because we create bubbles, like you're saying. I think when you talk about how empathy is disruptive, especially for people who kind of represent the status quo, I think part of that is because to circle back, you need safety to feel empathy. And we don't have, a lot of people don't have that safety. Even people who might have, yeah. um, financial safety or you know historically racial safety whatever like the emotional safety has not been like a very highly prioritized thing in in our culture you know um vulnerability men like you having a podcast like this <laughs> i do think that's changing right i do think a lot i see a lot of situations where men are opening up avenues to talk to each other about feelings and emotions and experiences yeah. um, in ways that are different. And, you know, people who are like our age who have kids are trying to teach their kids, boys, girls, whatever, that, um, that it is safe to feel and to care about things. Um, and yeah. some people think there's an overcorrection and then, you know, that's, that's, that's fair in some ways, surely. But, um, I think that's part of that equation is part of how we got here is, um, that, that fear that people feel when they are challenged or disrupt or asked to have empathy is mm -hmm. a lack of safety. And then it's a feedback loop. Right. Mm -hmm. You have to have empathy to create that safety for other people and then vice versa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are lots of individual situations. I'm always careful to say where like I'm never advocating for someone to like go talk to a person who genuinely wishes them ill and ha and show that, you know, like that's never what I'm talking about. But yeah, at the, at the system scale, I think um I think, yeah, we've identified some of the problems, but I don't know that we are the ones who have the resources to really, to, to, to wave a magic wand and fix them, but we're doing our part, right? We're trying. <laughs> I mean, I, I get overwhelmed daily thinking about it. And uh, I think we are trying and I think we are doing wonderful work. I have to believe that. Right. Right. And I, I tell myself all the time, it's one heart at a time. That's all I can do. Like I, 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 I think, and I've mentioned this before, but I think it was Michelle Obama saying something along those lines, like change happens in small moments, mm. not, not in these big romantic gestures that right. like society really cherishes and loves and movies we love and, you know, all that stuff. But it's really like 
the small moments. Right. And you're not going to find a lot of small moments in a Twitter thread or comment section. Yeah. Not to say that they're not beneficial in any way, but yeah. One, yeah. one thing that has that really busted my mind open about a lot of this was um, How to Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell. Mm. Um, I've, I've heard of the book. I haven't read it. I've heard it's great. Highly, highly, highly recommend because especially on that point of small moments, quietness, boredom, pauses, you know, it seems obvious, but it's really not. <laughs> yeah, I, I think about that, like even with like I follow the nap ministry on Instagram. Yes. Yeah. I'm familiar. Yeah. Um, and I think about that with like parents too. You know, I think about for yourself, right? Like I think about my, my sister, Claire, who has two, you know, beautiful kiddos and it feels like they're constantly busy, just like activity upon activity upon activity. And that's not a criticism, but I do wonder sometimes if like that's creating a pattern that like, oh, I have to be busy and this is the value and this is my life. This is my identity. Mm -hmm. Whereas like there is so much and related to empathy and related to care and um, creativity and, and, creativity and, and curiosity. Mental health. Yeah. Uh, is in the slowing down, is into like, go be bored by yourself for, a, for an hour, right? Yeah. And I had a lot of that growing up because my parents weren't around at times and, you know, I just was off in the woods, you know, just exploring and that was very beneficial. So, yeah, I think about that too. Um in way, a, ways people are raising their kids today, yeah. There's a um, Gen Zer whose name I can't remember right now, but she helped found this organization. I think it's just called Log Off. It's like the Log Off movement. Okay. And this is why I talk about being hopeful for the future because these younger people who are like in their teens and early 20s recognize that all of this is not sustainable. And she talks about that, how she was never bored when she was a kid. And she, she resents that. And she wishes that she had had the opportunity to do weird things that her mom tells her she did um, because she was bored and nothing else to do. Yeah. And she's coming up with all these strategies and um, discussion points and stuff for fellow Gen Z and younger about the importance of logging off. So I love that. Yeah. You should talk yeah. to her. I'll, I'll, I'll find her name. <laughs> yeah, I would love that. I would, I would really love that. You know, maybe Whitney Houston was right. That children are our future. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's also uh, just math, but yeah. <laughs> it, <laughs> fair point. It is also just math. I know that that's so funny. Uh, I love that. Um, I, and I like in all seriousness, I am very hopeful about it too. Cause I do see, you know, it's just from like a mental health advocacy and awareness perspective, kids being open about their mental health, right? Like, whereas like when I was a kid, I'm locking that shit down, you know, I am weird and I'm alone and I'm going to struggle through this because no one can care parents. or understand. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And their parents. Like, that's why I'm like, it's, I see, and I have to see it, right? Like you said, you have to believe you're doing something worthwhile. Like I have a kid, so I have to believe that, um, she's going to be the future is going to be brighter yeah. for her. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Well, I'm feeling good about the world because I've spoken with you, Caitlin. That's wonderful. I feel that too. I feel a little more motivated and a little less stressed out. So good. I don't know if it's the plants I can see behind you <laughs> or the conversation or mix of the two. <laughs> Maybe a mix of the two. Maybe a mix yeah. of the two. No, thank you. This is genuinely a really good um, affirming conversation. Mm, glad to hear it. Um, well, we always wrap up the show talking about our empathy heroes. So mm. authors we love, uh, people in our lives, uh, movie characters, characters from books we love. I will go first to give you a okay, moment to reflect. About it for a second. <laughs> so my empathy hero uh, this week is... Um, James Baldwin, the writer, uh, who had a birthday this month uh, as we're recording this in August of 2022. And uh, I think I've mentioned this quote before, but I just love it. And it's one of my favorite quotes of all time. So I'm going to read it again right into your ear holes. James Baldwin says, 
you think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. It was books that taught me that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive, who had ever been alive. Mm. Good stuff. I feel like I could take a year to decide this, um, but I am going to go with a person who whose quote I have on my mirror and I look at it every day. Um, it's and I don't actually even know if she really said this, but but someone told me she did. So you might want to fact check. Jane Goodall has had a quote allegedly that was um, what you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Mm. Um, and, you know, I also think that her work involves a lot of different things, but a piece of it is, you know, what's our distance from animals? What's the real difference? Um, there's a lot of mirroring there, you know. A lot of empathy. On empathy. And, um, but I also just think that quote is so powerful and a reminder that everything you do has an impact um but you have control over what that impact might be so yeah 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 i love that i love that a lot jane goodall is is a great empathy hero um who i don't know if has been mentioned on this show so good for you and this you know this is we're in the i don't know 240 episodes at this point so um there might be a good reason for that that i'm not aware of hopefully not hopefully she <laughs> It was revealed to be said by someone else entirely. I'm just kidding. Um, I think it's a great quote, and we're just going to call it a fact uh, on this show. Okay, this is the number one facts-based podcast. So. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Caitlin, uh, where can the feely humans out there connect with you, read your book, all of that joyful stuff? Yeah, you can find everything on my website which is caitlinugulik.com and i will spell that real quick k-a-i-t-l-i-n-u-g-o-l-i-k.com um and that's also where i am on twitter which i am on sometimes still um and yeah i'd love to hear from folks wonderful but uh not but why i don't know why i said but the the link uh to caitlin's website will be in the show notes for this episode at feelyhuman.co. Caitlin, what a delight. Thank you for uh, being empathetic. Thank you for uh, putting out good work, work in the world and, and, and making an impact. Yeah, you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. And to you listeners, as I always say, I'm here, you're here, we're here together on this wayward, overwhelming, awe-inspiring pale blue dot. We have each other. It's you, me, empathy.